and welcome to Scottsdale Christian Church. Hi, I'm Marlene. Welcome. Hi, my name's Eddie, and we're glad that you're here with us today. I'm Jace. Welcome. Hi, I'm Marie. Welcome. Hi, I'm Simone, and welcome to Scottsdale Christian Church. Hi, I'm Trish. Welcome. I'm Chris. Welcome. Hi, I'm Jeannie. I just want to welcome you to Scottsdale Christian Church. I'm Taylor. Welcome. I'm Bo. Welcome to Scottsdale Christian Church. Hi, I'm Jacob. Welcome. Hi, I'm Sarah. Welcome to Scottsdale Christian Church. I'm Helen. Welcome. Hi, I'm Natasha. Welcome. I'm Ashley. Welcome.
Hi, I'm Phil. Welcome to Scottsdale Christian Church. How's everybody today? Good? Beats the heat, right? And being inside. Today, we're going to go back 2,700 years to a guy named Micah. Micah was a prophet of God. He's considered one of the 12 minor prophets. That means that his book was a little bit smaller than the books like Isaiah and, and uh, Jeremiah and them. So we're going to go into that. You know, his prophetic ministry took place in Samaria. It was a wealthy time, for Samaria anyway, but the poor were exploited at the expense of the wealthy. Widows were, convict, or were evicted from their homes, and travelers were robbed, and the rights of inheritance were completely disregarded, and the judges accept bribes. False prophets were leading people astray, and even the priests were demanding payment for their teaching. It sounds more like the 21st century than it does the 8th century B.C., right? does to me. But Micah spent his time pronouncing divine judgment in the name of God on the people of Israel. And he told them that they're going to be, they're going to be abandoned by God until one who comes out of Bethlehem, whose origins are from ancient times, and he will shepherd his flock in the strength and majesty of the Lord, and he will be their peace. So Micah, his, the prophet, tells them, straighten up. He calls them out in today's verse that we're going to read. It's in uh, page 650 of the Bibles that are in your chair. Micah is almost like right in the middle of the Bible. And in chapter 6, he says, With what shall we come to the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? What shall, shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Micah says in 6.8, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Let's pray. Father, um, we, we thank you today. We thank you for this place that we're at, this church. We pray for Brian as he's away. Uh, we pray for time of refreshment for him and for his family and for safety and, and that they would grow uh, some peace and, and some love and even farther, deeper into you as they, they see another part of, of the world that uh, you've created for our enjoyment and theirs too. So keep them safe, Father, away. Help it to be a, a real time of, of joy and, and togetherness. And Father, this morning as we go into your word, I just pray that... Uh, through all that's said, that your wisdom and your truth prevail, and that we learn this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you get one of my business emails, I have my signature at the bottom. It comes up automatically, and it's got all this contact information. You know, my phone number, my main number, my fax number, my number, 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 the website number. Underneath all of that, I have six words, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Those have been favorites of mine, but it's also, it's a call to commitment to myself, how I'm going to live out the day, how I'm going to show that to the people that I work with, and to the people I come in contact with. And I hope that it would be a testimony of my life to them and how they'll be treated when they're doing business with me. It's kind of tough in a worldly standard. So you start with asking a question, you know, act justly. It's a command in this context. So do we act justly? Do we have justice? The question is, what is justice? We've got so many people today that are crying out for justice. I want justice. He did this to me. What's going to happen to him? Somebody shoots a policeman. Let's shoot the policeman back. Or I'm sorry, the policeman shoots somebody. And then what are we going to do? We're going to kill the cops because they had to shoot somebody in the line of work. Everybody wants justice. Lawsuits abound for everything. In a wreck, need a check. <laughs> Those guys are probably more popular than Jesus in the Valley of the Sun. Isn't that a sin? 
Because you knew exactly who I was talking about, didn't you? Those two clown bikers, whatever they're. In the nonprofit field, I meet a lot of different people. I go to some meetings. I, I used to belong to an organization for nonprofit executives, and you, you get together with all the executive directors and you talk about executive director stuff. And uh, I met a lady one time, and we started the conversation, and she was telling me, well, my nonprofit exists to promote social justice. I thought, okay. So I questioned her a little bit more about social justice. And I found out she had a really weird idea of what justice is. And as the conversation went on, she became even less social. Ooh. <laughs> you know, Dr. Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Without justice, the thinking goes, peace is an elusive goal. No justice, no peace. So what is justice? God's given us his definition of justice, and it's grounded in truth. And the thing about truth is it can never be proven wrong. It's always right. It's always going to be right. Whether we want to tell it or not, whether we want to believe it or not, is up to us. But the truth is the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the light. So justice is truth. God loves truth. No wonder he loves truth. It lasts forever, just like him. He's grounded in truth. Well, Jesus put, put this truth in its simplest form, the truth about justice. In Matthew 7, 12, he said, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law of the prophets. And that's not an easy thing to do. And God tells us about that in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 28, 5, he says, Evil men do not understand justice. But those who seek the Lord understand it fully. Seek the Lord. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, you'll not be condemned. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Jesus tells us that he's the only one that's been given the authority to judge. And he gives us a standard for what we believe in because true justice has been placed in his hands. In John 5.30 he says, By myself... I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Talking about the Father. Seeking to please his Father. Finding true justice, true judgment, and the pleasing of the Father. Just like Jesus, we act justly to please the Father. We're followers of Christ, made righteous by his sacrifice. Being righteous with God means being in Christ, and all our actions need to reflect being in that righteousness. We're imitators of Jesus. That's our life here on this earth, to be imitators of Jesus. So what is justice? Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Pretty simple answer, but it's pretty hard. Pretty hard in this day and age, and in these bodies of flesh that we have. But we work at it. We pray about it. We get together here about it and practice justice with each other first. So we act justly. But then we're to love mercy. Don't just have mercy. Don't just give mercy. Love mercy. Wow. Mercy's forgiveness. Do we love to forgive? When we truly love something, it becomes part of who we are. And you hear people say, well, I love him, but I don't have to like him. I love her, but I can never forgive her for what she's done to me. You could look at that and say, bull -oni. That's not in the Bible, and Jesus never said it. He said that we love each other unconditionally. Unconditionally. I'm going to read a story from uh, Matthew. It's not going to be up there on the screen. I'm going to read it for you. It's called The Parable of the Unmerciful Servant. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. 
Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to pay the debt. Not just his stuff, but him, the wife, the kids, all be sold to pay this man's debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants, who he owed a hundred denarii. He grabbed him. He began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me. I think he said that himself, didn't he? Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off, had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. When the master called the servant in, he said, you wicked servant, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had the same mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all that he owed. And then Jesus said, this is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. The heart. The heart. Forgive from the heart. Love from the heart. I heart you. From the heart. A change of heart. You know, we've all seen the love chapter in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 13. We hear it at weddings. It seems very appropriate for that. I found a version in, a, in, in the message. And uh, it's actually in your bulletin inserts. And I want you to take a look at it. It's going to look like this here. Hopefully, you all got a bulletin as you walked in. And if you didn't, take the devotional, because it's in the devotional in the middle of the week, too. But we're going to go through that for a second here. And I love the way the message portrays it. It says, love never gives up. Love cares more for others than self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps looking to the end. I think that's beautiful. But you notice there's some blank spaces in the front here. The word mercy fits right in with that. Mercy never gives up. Mercy cares more for others than self. Mercy doesn't want what it doesn't have. Mercy doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle. Mercy keep, doesn't keep the score of sins of others. And mercy doesn't revel when others grovel. Mercy takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. Puts up with everything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back. Mercy keeps going to the end. Love, mercy, they work together. Now, if you want a real challenge, instead of putting mercy in there, put your name in that blank. Tom never gives up. Eddie cares more for others than for himself. Jonathan doesn't want what he doesn't have. <laughs> Sorry, Jonathan, just calling you out there, good buddy. You get the message, right? Put your name in there. In Ephesians 2.4, we see just how much Jesus showed his love and mercy for us. And he said, because of this great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. The church needs to practice this amongst themselves, among ourselves, before we can take it to the world. Yeah, we've got a message of salvation for the world, but we've got we to work it out in here too. And then we go, because in Jude, first chapter of Jude, in fact, I think there's only one chapter in Jude, be merciful for those who doubt, Save others from snatching them, save others by snatching them from the fire. 
to show others to show mercy mixed with fear of clothing hating stained by corrupted flesh Christians are followers of Jesus we are to be channels of God's mercy in the church and in the world and in doing all that we have to still walk humbly we act justly we love mercy we forgive and we walk humbly how naturally does humility come to us? The Bible tells us that human nature is full of pride, selfishness, we're opinionated, egotistic, greedy, arrogant, envious, hard-headed. We need a change of heart, a renewing of our minds, a repentance, a turning away from what we've been doing. Everything around, revolves around our schedule, our lives, you might have heard the quote that says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. That gets quoted in a lot of different church settings especially. And it's true, but the very basis of the covenant that we enter into with God when we accept Christ as our Savior is that now we will look for the best interests of others instead of our own. And the most important of that best interest is our relationship with God through Jesus. And to do that, we need to understand, too, that we're in a covenant relationship. We're not in a contract relationship. I can go next door to this car dealership and buy a car and sign a contract to finance it, and they're going to tell me, you're going to pay $300 a month. But if you don't pay it, we're coming to get your car. That's a contract. That's looking out for their best interests next door. But if they were looking out for my best interest, they'd say, okay, if you can't make that $300 a month payment, we'll make it for you. In fact, if you lose your job, we'll help you find a job. In fact, if that car gets a flat tire, we're going to come out and fix it. All you got to do is call. We'll put gas in it for you because we know that it's in your best interest to have that car. Will, will they do that? God gave up so much with Jesus to look out for our best interests. He keeps our tanks full. Philippians 2, 3 to 8. It says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. That reminds me of a song. Loretta, Loretta Lynn wrote a song many years ago, a little gospel song, and she's, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. That's what it's saying here. Did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. What a humble act to give up your life for somebody else. We're followers of Christ. We're followers of Jesus. About 100 years ago, there was a guy, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. You might have heard of him if you've gone to Bible studies and things like that. And he wrote a, actually wrote a little sermon called Micah's Message for Today. And he said, humility must be in the heart. Then it will come out spontaneously as the outflow of life in every act that a man performs. Walk humbly when you are spiritually strong. Walk humbly when you have much work to do. Walk humbly in all your motives. Walk humbly while studying God's word. Walk humbly when under trials. Walk humbly in your devotions. Walk humbly between you and your brothers and sisters in Christ. And walk humbly 
when dealing with sinners. True humility is thinking rightly of you, not meanly, but when you have found who you really are, you will be humble, for you are nothing to boast of. To be humble will make you safe. To be humble will make you happy. To be humble will make music in your heart when you go to bed. And to be humble here will make you wake up in the likeness of your master by and by. Now, you younger people might not know that expression, by and by, but that means eventually, in due time, your humility in due time will bring you into the likeness of your master, Jesus. In 1912, a guy named Dale Carnegie began teaching courses on public speaking to professional men and women uh, in, uh, in New York. After several sessions, he made this brilliant observation that gradually as seasons passed, I realized that as surely as these adults needed training in public speaking, they needed still more training in the fine art of getting along with people in everyday business and social contacts. So he looked around and there was no books written on this in any schools or any practical courses on it. And the, he had discovered that it was a survey was taken and the second most popular thing that people wanted to know other than how to succeed in business was how to understand and get along with people. Hmm. So he decided to try and write a book on his own about the subject. And he interviewed some of the most successful people in the world, businessmen from New York, some of the presidents of the United States, Thomas Edison, Albert Einstein. These are people that he talked to. And these are some of the gems that he came up with. Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Be a good listener. Make the other people, make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. If you are wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically and appeal to the nobler motives. The book's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. You know, you might have read it. And as of 2011, it was a 75th year in print, sold over 30 million copies. The world looking for answers on how to get along 30 million times at least. And I know it's still in publication now. People are still reading it. I read it for crying out loud, only because somebody donated it to the thrift store and I had picked up an old copy of it. But it's fascinating. And as I read it, I thought, you know what? This guy, if he had only started a Bible study, eventually he would have got to the sixth chapter of Micah and found out how to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Huh. But then he wouldn't have got all that money from that thing from the Dale Carnegie courses. So. But I'm conv convinced of that. So the church, we're here to win friends and influence people, but not for us, for Jesus, for Christ's sake, not ours, not our success, but the glory of God. You see, we're, we're created to live in eternity for God's glory. But we start that here and now. We're weak in the flesh, but Christ strengthens us. The righteousness of God's word is fulfilled in us, and we don't walk in the flesh, but in the spirit. And when we do that, we will act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Jesus, by the power of his spirit, has made us righteous for his glory. He enables us to live in obedience, which we can't do ourselves. It can't happen without accepting Jesus as your savior. You can hear about his mercy and love, but you have to believe it. And then you turn from your old life and get a renewed life in him. And you know, if you're here today and you haven't started that, you haven't started that walk, you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, it's time to do it right now. And if you've done it already, you just keep on coming. You just keep learning. You just keep practicing. You keep reading. You keep studying. You keep praying. You keep talking to each other, loving each other, forgiving each other, treating each other like Jesus. There's a lot of stuff going on that, that hurts the world. We saw it again even last night. 
acts, random acts of violence, acts of evil, acts of hate. We're going to fight that battle. We're going to fight it with this church right here on the corner of 70th Street and McDowell Road. And we're going to fight it as brothers and sisters in Christ in the worldwide church. So, just make sure that if you uh, haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, that you think about it today. I'll pray with you after the service if you want. Tom will be here. Just about anybody that's here that's on staff or with the team would love to talk with you about Jesus and about his love for us. Don't wait. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you for directions on how to, on how to live, act justly, love mercy, to walk humbly with our God, not by ourselves, but with you, Lord. And so we commit our lives to you today to do these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Yeah.
my heart and my soul, but I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. I let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out, Lord. 